What's up you guys, The Curious Owl here, and I am going to do a audiobook review of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. I love the Harry Potter series so much. I am a Hufflepuff through and through. I'm so happy to be a part of the Hufflepuff clan, and I took the quiz on Pottermore, and I'm also part of the Puck Wedgie group for Ilvermorny. So anyone that is a Hufflepuff or Puck Wedgie, let me know down in the comments below so we can celebrate our Hufflepuff and Puck Wedginess. So for those of you who may not have read Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone or watched the movie, the story follows a young boy named Harry Potter who essentially is known as the boy who lived because when he was about a year old a dark wizard named Voldemort had essentially gone around and killed several witches and wizards around the wizarding world and Harry was the only person that was able to live past the curse he had given him and so because of that Voldemort had lost a lot of power and had essentially gone into hiding while Harry was left with a lightning bolt scar on his forehead. He is sent to his aunt and uncle's house, the Dursleys, and lives there in the Muggle world with no knowledge of the Wizarding world until he turns 11 years old. When he is asked to come to Hogwarts, the school of witchcraft and wizardry, and go into training to become a wizard himself just like his mother and father did when they were his age. And it's very strange for him. He doesn't know exactly what to do because he's never known anything about magic in the first place. So he's really scared. He doesn't know what's going on. But luckily, very quickly, he makes two friends, Ronald Weasley and Hermione Granger. In terms of what goes on in this installment of the Harry Potter series, there is a special item that is trying to be stolen by some dark force. No one is sure who it is or what it is and if it has any ties to Voldemort, but it is a special stone called the Sorcerer's Stone, and when Harry, Ron, and Hermione find this out, they immediately think that it is Voldemort, and they try to find out where the stone is and who exactly is going to steal it in order to give it to possibly Voldemort. One of my favorite things about the entire Harry Potter series is the way Way that JK Rowling writes the stories. They're very clear, concise words, but at the same time, it's very flowery because it's very magical. It's placed in a magical time, and it's very, very humorous as well. There's a lot of amazing jokes that go between Harry and some of the other characters or other characters between themselves. It's such a funny, funny book, and I caught myself literally laughing out loud as I was listening to it on audiobook, and I would have people looking at me funny, and I and I have to like explain to them that I was listening to an audiobook because there were so many things that I forgot that was funny about the books when I had read it the first time when I was very young. As far as the characters, I think one of my favorite things about the characters is mostly the supporting characters. I love Harry, Ron, and Hermione a lot, but I also love a lot of the supporting characters because I feel like they don't get enough credit. For instance, Hagrid. Rubius Hagrid is the sweetest man on the face of the earth. He goes above and beyond to make Harry incredibly comfortable when it comes to moving in to Hogwarts and learning about the wizarding world. And he's just... He's such a wonderful man. He just he has so much love in his heart for everyone, but people take advantage of him so easily and he's just he just tries to make people happy and I just want to give him a big hug because I just love how he just tries to make everyone happy and he tries to just make people smile and laugh and feel loved and I just Ugh, I love him. Then as far as Dumbledore, Dumbledore really doesn't play a huge role in this novel. He doesn't really play a huge role in any of them until probably once the sixth book, The Half-Blood Prince, comes around. But in this one, he really tries to make Harry feel comfortable and is able to tell him a little bit about some of the magical things that he comes across in the course of the novel. For instance, The Mirror of Erised, where Harry sees the looks of his parents for the first time in his entire life. And I just love how Dumbledore has always been this mentor figure for Harry because he understands how powerful Harry really is and he's trying to eke him in a certain direction to be able to find out more about exactly how he can defeat Voldemort in the end. And I just wish for the love of God though that he would just get to it. Like he wouldn't have to have Harry go through all of these traumatic events that would happen in not just the Sorcerer's Stone but the rest of the series because they are so dangerous half the time. Like, Harry literally risks his life to learn these lessons and learn these things about Voldemort when Dumbledore could just freaking tell him in the first place what's going on. I don't understand how why he thinks that it is okay to have Harry risk his life in order to find out information about Voldemort and how he can stop him and how he can finally be rid of him. Then there is 
Miss Minerva McGonagall, who is the sassiest woman in the world. I love Minerva's sass so much. She is so shady. She is so petty. And I absolutely love it because she, in a way, is kind of the comedic relief. But at the same time, she almost kind of acts as that motherly figure that I think that Harry really needs. Like, if Dumbledore is, like, the father mentor figure, McGonagall is definitely the mother mentor figure in this series. Then there's Neville, who I absolutely love. And I actually actually really dislike the fact that Neville was not as big of a character in the movies as he is in the book because he was such a prominent character in the first book which I didn't remember from years ago. I totally forgot how much he actually did with Harry and Hermione especially when Ron was in the infirmary um, and I just I can't believe they didn't incorporate him as much in the movies as they should have because he had so many good lines. He was such a good friend. He really was just this amazing character. He just wanted friends. He just wanted to be a part of something. And because he's always been that kind of a character that's been kind of dubbed as the loser and he's not very good at magic, but he still tries so hard. He warms my little, little, little witch heart inside. I just... I love him so much. I definitely think, though, that he should have played a bigger role in the movies, which kind of makes me mad. But at the same time, I think they were trying to focus more on the companionship of Ron, Harry, and Hermione, which I don't necessarily disagree with. But Neville was a huge part of that, too, and I wish he would have had a bigger impact in the movies. However, despite my love for this book, I've got some questions. I've got some bones to pick with some people that have read the Harry Potter series. Why does Dumbledore keep Hagrid around for so long? long. Hagrid, obviously, I love Hagrid to death, don't get me wrong, but he is a blumbering idiot half the time. So why does Dumbledore keep him around so much? Well, why does he keep him as a gameskeeper on the ground? Like, what exactly happened to him that made Dumbledore want to keep him around despite having been expelled from Hogwarts? That is something that is never a really expressed, and I really wish that it was. I don't know if it's going to be expressed further in the Chamber of Secrets when I read that one, but why? Just why? Why? I don't remember who exactly tells Harry this, but somebody in the novel towards the end of it tells Harry about Snape's supposed debt to Harry's father, James, because James had ended up saving his life at one point, and so in return, his debt was to watch over Harry and try to keep him from harm's way. I don't know necessarily, though, if it's necessarily a debt to James, but it's more of or less something that he promised himself when Lily died because he loved Lily so much, which is expressed later on in the series. He loved Lily so much that I think he almost, in a way, wanted to protect Harry for Lily's sake as opposed to James. I really don't think it was a debt to James at all for saving his life. I definitely think it was more because of Lily, his love for Lily, that he wanted to protect Harry. And I just would, I would like to see that be kind of more clear as far as the reasoning behind it. So I, I don't know if that's expressed later on in the books, but that is something that I kind of was like, I don't really believe that that is really the case, but that may be just a preference of opinion. So let me know what your opinion is of that down in the comments below. Okay, this next thing really made me angry. So when Harry and Hermione are going up to the Owlery to drop off Norbert to Ron's older brother, Bill, they somehow forget the cloak in the tower and they're caught by McGonagall when they are out of bounds after hours. How in the world could Harry forget his freaking cloak? Like, that is something that he treasures so much when he finds it, when he gets it for Christmas. How could he exactly forget about it that quickly and not remember to grab it before they leave the Owlery? Like, how does that even happen? I don't understand. My next question is more kind of a context thing. I wish it would have been explained a little more. Is how exactly did Professor Quirrell meet Voldemort and how exactly did Voldemort end up attached to Quirrell? That is never expressed, but there is a point where Quirrell, there, when we first meet Professor Quirrell, Hagrid talks about how he had gone essentially on what I would think it would be like a sabbatical or kind of like a vacation to do research. Um, I think that he mentioned something where Quirrell went off and did something and supposedly something bad must have happened to him because then he comes back with this stammer and he's very shy. He's very kind of reserved, which wasn't like him. That wasn't something he was before. So my question 
is then is that when he met Voldemort was it just after Harry had defeated him and basically was powerless was that when he met, had met Quirrell or was it after that was just something that was never really explained that I kind of had a question about like I don't know how those two would have met if they did and how he was able to exactly morph himself to the back of Quirrell's head there's just so many questions regarding that, and that's, I feel like, something that I would want to ask J.K. Rowling herself if I got the chance. And then finally, my last question is, how does Malfoy know exactly that Harry, Ron, and Hermione are at Hagrid's with when he has Norbert? How does he know that they're in Hagrid's hut at that time? Does he, like, just follow them all the time? Does he stalk them? Which, honestly, would not surprise me if he does. But how does he even know that they are there? Why didn't he go to Hagrid's in the first place? Like, I don't understand, because... He must have known something was up, but it was never, like, expressed, like, how he knew something was up if he knew that there was something up. But there you guys go. Those are my thoughts, feels, and ideas on the first Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. It really wasn't too much of a review, honestly, because I really loved it. I honestly think if I'm going to reread all of these books, it's going to be five out of five stars because just for nostalgia purposes, really. But I do enjoy a lot of the supporting characters as well. I do enjoy the language of it because it's very clear and concise, but also incredibly magical. The world building is so good. And I just, there's so many good things about this these books that I just really don't think that there's much to really go off of after that. But anyway, thank you guys so much for joining me in this video. If you guys did enjoy it, please do give it a big thumbs up. And if you're not already and you'd like to be, hit that button down below and subscribe to become an owl at Narflock. And I will see all of you guys in my next video. Bye guys. <laughs>